I'm going to talk about thread safety in Ruby. We're going to start out with a demo. This demo is going to use 200 threads, and alternating threads are going to update and access a shared data structure called members. I've never had problems with concurrency in Ruby, so I expect this to work. I'm going to use Ruby 2.0 and run this demo three times. As I said, I've never had problems, so this should work. Now I'm going to change it to use 10 threads, and I'm going to use JRuby because you get more performance with JRuby, and I want to use JRuby. So JRuby 174, I'm going to run this demo three times, and as I said, I've never had problems with concurrency in Ruby, so this should work as well, right? Seems to work. Run it three times for good luck. Now I'm going to change it to 200 threads because 10 threads really is not that much and I want to get more performance, better performance. So 200 threads, I'm going to run this three times. First time seems to work. Let's do it one more time. Hope it works also. And it seems like it doesn't work the second time. It says, can't add a new key into hash during iteration. So what's going on here? Why do we see an inconsistency? There is no such thing as thread-safe Ruby code. Why? Because different Ruby implementations have different semantics. I work on the Ruby driver at MongoDB. Um, I'm an adjunct faculty at Columbia University, and I'm not an expert on concurrency. I've just had a particular experience that I want to avoid and I want you all to avoid. So I can sort of see you. Raise your hand if you've ever debugged a concurrency issue. And keep your hand up if it was really fun and you want to do it again. <laughs> right, okay. What? what are you talking about? You don't want to do that again. <laughs> so I never want to do this ever again. So I'm going to share my experience with you and talk about concurrency in Ruby and why it's interesting and different from concurrency in other languages. And then point out some things that you should keep in mind when you're thinking about writing thread-safe code. So we're all going to, we're going to do this in 20 minutes. So in talking about thread safety, we're going to talk about concurrency in Ruby, as I said, why it's interesting, why it's different from other languages. We're going to talk about writing thread-safe code, and then we're going to talk about testing, which is pretty difficult because concurrency problems are only ever really detected or evident after they've happened. So you want to make sure that in your test, you're testing, you're putting the right strains on the right parts of your code. So let's look at the demo code a little slower now. We had a shared data structure called members. It's a set, which is a derivative of hash. And we 200 times created a thread, and then alternating threads uh, either added a member to the set or tried to access a member of the set. And we saw that um, with Ruby 2.0 and 200 threads, it seemed to work. We ran it three times. Maybe if we ran it 10 times, it wouldn't have worked, but let's just say it works in Ruby 2.0. Then we saw with JRuby and 10 threads, it worked as well, or at least it worked three times with 10 threads. But then we saw with JRuby 200 threads, it didn't work. So what's going on here? Is this an inconsistent bug? There are different Ruby implementations, and different Ruby implementations have their own semantics. In particular, they have their own semantics regarding how threads work. And so we're going to look at how threads work and compare JRuby to MRI 187 and, um, and 19 and 20, and think about how uh, th the threading model is different in these different implementations of Ruby. It's also different in Rubinius, but in the interest of time, we're going to stick with JRuby and MRI. So let's say that threads are like music. So in looking at how, how threads work differently, Let's use the metaphor of music because I think um, it sort of uh, makes the, the ideas more, the, con the concepts more concrete. So how are threads like music? Let's say we have a conductor. The conductor is going to be the gill. The conductor will tell the orchestra or instruments what notes they play, when they play them, and which instruments play these notes. So let's, let's pretend this is the gill, the conductor. A green thread is going to be a note. A note is something that needs to be played, and a green thread is going to be something that needs to be executed. A green thread is a thread that's scheduled by the interpreter. And that's in contrast to a native or operating system thread, which is scheduled by the operating system. And we're going to pretend that native or operating system threads are instruments. So how does this work? Using this metaphor, how can we describe how threads work in Ruby 1.8? So, in Ruby 1.8, we only have one OS thread, so we only have one instrument. We have the gill, we have the conductor, 
And the conductor will tell the violin, which is the only, only instrument we're allowed to use, you play this note, this note, this note, this note. So it's one after another, and we have no parallelism. We have no chords. In Ruby 1.9, we have um, still a gill. We still have the conductor, but we're allowed to use different instruments. So we're allowed to use different OS threads. But we still have a gill, so the gill still would prevent us from having two instruments play at the same time. We have no parallelism here. And then if we look at JRuby, we don't have a gill. We don't have a conductor. So green threads can actually be executed at the same time on two OS threads and can actually make use of multiple cores and execute instructions in parallel. So this is the fundamental difference between threading in 181920 and JRuby. And so there are different semantics. When I write a line of code in Ruby, that corresponds to a lot of little instructions happening um, on my computer. And if the, if, with the difference in semantics and the difference in threading models, we're going to find that JRuby will execute the code a little differently. So different Rubies have different semantics. Our code sometimes, our code, our, our MRI code sometimes works by sheer luck. We're lucky our code hasn't run on JRuby or Rubinius. And we're lucky there's a gill. The gill is not like training wheels. It's more like we should think about it more as a technical limitation. So in making some of these concepts a little more concrete, we're going to use the Ruby driver, the MongoDB Ruby driver, to uh, show how um, we might have some potential concurrency bugs and what we can do to solve them or prevent them. Before I show you the driver, a snippet of code from the driver, I just need to explain quickly what a replica set is in MongoDB. A replica set consists of a number of nodes that are one of two types. They can either be a primary or secondary. In a replica set, you can have at most one primary, and all of your other nodes are secondary. You write to a primary, your secondaries replicate from the primary, and you can read from either a primary or a secondary. So in the driver, a thread will come in and say, hey, driver, I need to do this right. I need to do this operation. Can you give me a node that's a primary? And the driver will have to know which nodes are a primary and which nodes are secondary. So that means that I have a, sh a cached state of the replica set in my driver. And what makes this sort of hard is that in the driver, you need to detect when there might be changes in the replica set state. So in MongoDB, we have automatic failover in our replica sets. That means that we will have a number of nodes, and one will be elected as the primary, and the secondaries will replicate from it. But if that primary goes down, a, another primary is selected to be, another uh, secondary is selected to be the primary, and then if that, other, that original primary comes back online, it becomes a secondary. So the point here is we have mutable shared state. And the driver needs to keep track of this state. So let's look at some code. In the Ruby driver, this is a highly simplified way that we uh, build up the shared mutable state. Uh, you won't find this in the Ruby driver because I smushed some code together to make it um, conceptually clear. But in theory, this is what happens. We have an initialized method that creates a set and then a method that says connect to nodes. What that does is connect to a single node in the replica set. That node has its own view of the replica set state. It gets that configuration, goes through its list of other, its view of the replica set, its other nodes that it can see, and tries to connect to each one of them and builds up its cache view of the, the replica set state. And that's what happen, what's happening in connect to nodes. In choose node, that's what a thread will use to, to get a node that it wants to send its operation to. So this might look a little familiar to what we saw in the beginning. There, is, there are two places, one where a set, a shared state is between threads is being updated, and another place where it's being accessed. So this is a potential concurrency bug. So what can we do about this concurrency, potential concurrency issue? You might see something like, can not add a new key into hash during iteration if you were using enough threads and JRuby. Not that we've ever actually seen this in the Ruby driver. Um, why is this such a big deal? Why do we really need to pay attention to these potential concurrency issues with a set, for example? A set is a derivative of hash. And we use hashes all over the place as caches. This is a common pattern in Ruby. And 
as I said, hashes and their derivatives are not thread safe in Ruby. So we really need to pay attention to how we're using these derivatives of hash and hash itself. So what can we do about this code? How can we write this code thread safely? Well, there are a number of ways that you can approach these types of problems. Uh, some of them involve implementing patterns, but overall, you should be familiar with concurrency primitives if you want to uh, solve some of these problems. So, and as the first rule of thumb, though, you should say, do I have shared data? If I can avoid having shared data, I will, because then I don't really have to deal with this stuff. If you can't avoid shared data, at least avoid shared mutable data. And if you can't avoid shared mutable data, then you need to know concurrency primitives or think about using other patterns. So we're going to talk about two concurrency primitives, just so that we can um, make some of these concepts a little more conc concrete. The first one is called a mutex. Mutex comes from mutual exclusion. What that means is that I have uh, bits of code that I identify as being, uh, that should be single threaded so that at most one thread can be executing any one of these bits of code at any point in time. So you're basically, you're choosing bits of code to be single threaded. And these bits of code are called the critical section. So what we did here in the Ruby driver was we wrapped those two lines that I identified as being problematic and potentially leading to a runtime error and we put a synchronized method around it. So what this synchronized method does is it, grab, it gets a lock, and then it yields to the block, passed to the method, and then it unlocks. So these two bits of code now are mutually exclusive. Only one thread can execute them at one time. And so this is where we're updating the shared replica state, and this is where we're accessing it on the bottom. So now we've solved our concurrency issue. We're not going to see this bug anymore. But it's not as easy as that. A mutex is not magic. There are a lot of other things you need to think about when you're using a mutex. In particular, you need to avoid locking around I.O. I.O. is opening a file, making a network request. These are things that are, de are de dependent on external resources. And the last thing you want is to have a lock around code, to have code that's single-threaded dependent on an external resource. Because you could potentially have all of your threads waiting for that one external resource. So when we look back at this code, I had a line, uh, a bit here that says node.connect. This is checking to make sure the node is still up before I add it to my, my uh, cache state. I don't want to have the synchronized block, synchronized method wrapping this block. Changing this is actually pretty simple. I can just put it outside the block. But this, this um, really con like shows the point that when you have a mutex, you want to make sure that you're putting the mutex around the finest grain bit of code as possible. Because as I said, it's single threaded. And you're using multiple threads to get better performance. So you want to make sure that any points that are single threaded um, or that threads could potentially be waiting to execute, want, you want to make sure they're as fine tuned, fine grained as possible. The second thing that you need to consider is your resources. How are you using resources? So there's something called the thundering herd which is where you'd have a number of threads waiting for a particular resource or something to happen. And when that thing happens, they're all woken up, and, but only one is allowed to continue. So what's the point of waking all of them up? You're going to waste system resources if you're waking up all these threads in order to let one pass through. So this is something you need to think about as well. Are you waking up all of your th threads? Do you want to use maybe a queue instead so that you're only popping off the queue and you only let one thread continue? These are all things you need to think about. You need to think about your system as well. The second concurrency primitive that you should be familiar with is a condition variable. A condition variable <coughs> is used to signal between threads or send messages between threads. It's sort of like a thread raising a flag and saying, hey, um, you can try to get the lock now, or hey, I'm done with this resource. I've finished whatever I was doing. <coughs> so let's look at a bit of code from the Ruby driver again. This is, uh, we implement connection pooling. <clears throat> so the, the way it works is we have a thread to socket infinity. So a thread will come in and um, ask the pool for a socket to use. It'll consult the list of available sockets. If one is available, it'll take it and use it. If one's not available, it'll wait until another thread is done with its socket and returns it back to the list of available sockets. So here we're using a condition variable. Uh, to signal to all of the other threads in check-in that I've finished with my socket, and you can now loop around and try to get that available socket. 
So this, is, this might actually look a little familiar to what we were talking about with the thundering herd. Why is this a waste of system resources? This is a waste of system resources because only one thread is going to be allowed to enter that lockup there. So we might as well only wake up one thread. We're using broadcast here, so we're waking up all of the threads. We should use signal instead, which will only uh, use resources to allow one thread to loop around and try to get that lock and then get that available socket. So that's a condition variable in a nutshell. It's mutex in a nutshell. These are all things that you need to be familiar with when you start thinking about concurrency and running thread-safe code. Now on to testing. <clears throat> testing is hard because, as I said, concurrency issues sometimes only are apparent after they've happened. So what you want to do in your tests is make sure you put the strings on the right parts of your code and create the right scenarios for your code on your code. First of all, you need to make sure that you test with different implementations. So just because something works in MRI doesn't mean it's going to work in JRuby, as we saw in the demo. You're sometimes lucky that you haven't seen an issue in MRI, or sometimes lucky you haven't seen an issue in JRuby. So you also need to make sure that you test with a ton of threads. Because the more threads you have, the more con contingency you have, and the higher probability you have that you'll see a concurrency issue. And if you need more precision, then use patterns. So to give you an example of a pattern, there's something called the rendezvous pattern that we use, which is where you have a number of threads uh, do something and then are paused at a particular point, and then you uh, create some event or do something and allow them all to continue and watch them interact or try to fight for resources. In particular, in the Ruby driver, what we do is we have um, all of, we have threads uh, each do a find, so they all get a socket, and then we pause them, and then I kill a node, and then I allow the threads to continue. So one thread should detect the change in replica set state, update the state, this cache state in the driver, while the other threads detect socket errors and refresh their sockets and get new sockets. So you want to really focus in on those bits of code and those scenarios that could be problematic. In conclusion, concurrency in Ruby you need to know your implementations. As I said, it's not good enough that you test your code with MRI if people are going to be using JRuby or Rubinius or other implementations as well. Know your implementations. Know your concurrency primitives. You have to start thinking about what they are, how to use them, use patterns maybe. Um, you can't just blindly write code and cross your fingers and hope it works. And you also need to know your code. So I said there's no such thing as thread-safe Ruby code, but there is a such thing as thread-safe JRuby 174 code. And in knowing all of this, we can be prepared for the future of Ruby, the future of Rubinius, the future of JRuby, and all be prepared maybe to write Java someday. Thank you.